Um, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 25. I want you to get something to take notes. Um, we're going to go back into this series we began last week called Lost Arts. Let me give you the, the kind of the, the reasoning because I realize that's an uncommon um, title. Our faith is not new. Uh, it's about 2,000 years since the church was born. And over 2,000 years, you're going to gain some things like uh, understanding and, and knowledge, but um, you're also going to lose some things. And often when you read scripture, you will see practices that you're not practicing. And some of that's because it is a cultural context, but then sometimes it's because they're lost. And I, I just have this conviction that there are some things we've lost that could actually add a lot of life to our faith. So we're kind of going back and digging them out. And I just want to warn you, this is just kind of a pastoral warning. If you happen to be someone who, who you're just, this is just a casual Christianity thing for me. I'm just looking for a comfortable thing, a checklist thing. This is not going to be a great series for you. Um, and I bring that up because to find something takes effort. And so if you want to have a richer faith, like you may even be frustrated with your faith and desiring to, to reignite it, or you're saying, there's got to be more than this, you're going to love this series, because, um, but it's, you're going to be willing to dig in. If you're not willing to dig in, this is going to be challenging because it's kind of a 301 level series. This is not casual, it's comfortable. This is going to make you move into a deeper place with God. Um, but here's what I think you'll find. You're going to find some new strength in some old ways. So as you apply yourself to this series, I think you're going to find what you're looking for in some new strength and a richer faith. Today is going to be one that's really challenging. I want to talk to you today about the art of tarrying. The art of tarrying. And I realize you have no clue what I'm talking about, okay? So, I, so the best way for me to explain this and get us started, um, when Kayla and I were dating, we, um, we lived two and a half hours away from one another. So that means the lifeline of our relationship was our phone. Now, when I say phone, I do not mean what you think of when you think of phone. Uh, this was at a time when FaceTime didn't exist, texting wasn't a thing, very few people had cell phones. The phone that Kayla and I spent hours talking to each other on had a cord and was hooked to the wall, okay? Um, it, it was so, so kind of antiquated that I had to go to a gas station and buy what's called a phone card that would give me a code to call someone long distance, and there was a number of minutes on that phone card. Now, I realize, especially at this service, those of you who are under 30 think now I went to school with Alexander Graham Bell. Like, you're like, he's that old, okay? But um, here's what I, I want you to get. We would do this for hours, night after night. And I mean, we, we would ask each other questions. We would share experiences. But then there got to a place where we didn't have any more words. And so we just listened to each other breathe, you know. And, um, and, and I would, it would, usually it was time to get off the phone because the sun was coming up. And I would say to Kayla, I love you so much. I'll call you in a little bit. And then I, I wouldn't hang up. And she'd say, aren't you going to hang up? And I'd say, no, you hang up. And then, and then she'd go, no, you hang up. And then we'd do that, and then we'd just stay on there another hour, you know? Um, listen, that's how you get five kids, people, okay? So um, <laughs> here, I use that as an illustration to say this. There got to be a place in our relationship where it was no longer just about exchanging information. We got to the place where we just enjoyed each other's presence. We didn't call it this, but we valued just tarrying with one another. As you mature as a follower of Jesus Christ, there should be a place, a moment, a time, a point. When you move from a transactional faith that says, I do this and I get this, and you move to a place where you go, I am transformed by this reality, I just want to know him. Like it's no longer just about exchanging ideas, it's no longer just about sharing how I feel or covering my list, I want to know him. And I, I, I'm willing to stay longer in the biblical text because I just want to know his character. I'm willing to stay longer in worship because I just enjoy his presence. I'm willing to, to stay longer in prayer. I know I've covered the time that I normally cover, but I'm willing to stay longer because there's just to this place where I just want to remain, linger, stay in this moment with him. There is a place where you should have your 15 minutes of prayer before you go into a meeting. There is a place where you should take 30 minutes to start your day. There is also a place where you take off your watch and say, it's not about how much time, I just want to be with you, and you stay or tarry with him. Okay, um, That's a problem for us because we have a mindset that is get in and get out. Come on, get what I need, get out. 
And so what we've done is we've lost this. And in losing it, what we've gave up is an incredible amount of power. The working of God in us comes through our ability to tarry with him. I want you to see this in Matthew chapter 25. Um, so Matthew chapter 25 comes after Matthew chapter 24. <laughs> Selah, okay. Um, Matthew chapter 24, uh, the disciples asked Jesus, they said, hey, what's it going to look like at the end? Like right before you come back, what's the world going to look like? And he lists a bunch of signs. Um, by the way, many of those signs we see today, I've done a series if you're interested on that. Um, but he continues the conversation into Matthew 25, and here, here's what he does. He says, let me, let me take you from what the world's going to look like to take you what it's going to look like among followers of mine. And in Matthew 25, he gives an analogy, and it's going to be a little difficult for you to understand. I'm going to try to help you. He gives an analogy to help understand this, um, and it's Matthew 25, 1. He says, then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Now, let me, let me say, this is like no wedding you've ever been to. Um, there are ten bridesmaids who are potential brides. And they are waiting on a bridegroom, which is the groom, and he's going to come, and through a process of ceremonies, he's going to select one of them to become his bride. So this is less like a wedding you've attended and more like a reality show you've watched, okay? And, and so they, they're kind of preparing for this in a way. And um, it says five of these bridesmaids were foolish and five of them were wise. Well, why is that? Well, five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps, but the other five had enough olive oil. You see, when the bridegroom was delayed, it means he was going to be late, uh, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. And at midnight, they were roused with a shout that said, hey, the bridegroom's here. This process is starting. Light your lamp and head out. But notice what verse 7 it says, and all the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps, but then the five foolish ones asked the others, please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going to go out. But the others replied, we don't have enough for all of us. Go to Walmart and buy your own oil. But while they were gone to buy oil at Walmart, the bridegroom showed up. The ceremony began. And those who were ready went into the marriage feast or the next level with him, and the door was locked. And later, the other five who didn't have enough oil and went to Walmart, they stood outside saying, hey, can we still get in? And, and they said, no. Okay, so there's a lot here, but here's what I ultimately want you to see. Ten people wanted the exact same thing. They were dressed the same. Their aim was the same. Everything about them wanted to know the groom. And it's a reminder initially for us is this, that though we are followers of Christ, we're not all having the same experience. Based on how you live your life is going to determine there are people who follow Christ that experience more of Christ than other people who are also following Christ. And the whole split in these two groups really boils down to this one thing, oil. Those who have oil are rested. Those without oil are in anxiety. Those with oil are, are expectant in faith. Those without oil are, are in anguish, a concern of their loss. Those with oil experience a greater level of intimacy with the groom. Those without oil miss the whole thing. Now, this is the key to understanding this. In Scripture, oil is often a picture of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so... This is what, and, and this is interesting to me because um, Jesus is presented in Scripture as a groom. And so oil determined if they knew the groom, the Holy Spirit determines if we know Jesus. It's, it's only, you're only saved because the Holy Spirit showed you you needed Christ. It was his work that made you a follower of Christ. You can only worship through his act of, of working in your life. And your character only becomes like Jesus once the Holy Spirit allows that, that the gifts that are working like Jesus worked are based in the Holy Spirit. And that in, when Jesus actually returns, the only way he'll know you're his is because of a marking the Holy Spirit puts in your life. In the same way oil provided their relationship with the groom, the Holy Spirit provides our relationship with Jesus. Now this is where it gets interesting because though every follower has the Holy Spirit, there must be a differentiation of his work in their life. And here's what it boils down to. Five brides missed out because they didn't take the time to prepare and get enough oil. And five brides experienced the groom, because they took the time to get enough oil. Do you know what the cost of oil is? Time. 
Do you know what the container of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life is? Time. The time you give him gives him the space to work in you. And that is why in Isaiah 40 it says, those who wait on the Lord, those who give time to him, are renewed in strength. We give him time to gain his working and his power in our lives. Now, this is not just for us, and it's not just in this moment. This is literally in the working of Jesus. Jesus lived by a pattern that you can actually see again and again and again. It, and here's the pattern. He would retreat in his time with God, his Father. He would then reappear, and when he reappeared from that time, he released power. Let me show it to you. Um, the Bible says that before a miracle had ever been done, Jesus was baptized. After that baptism, he didn't go to sick people. The Bible says he went to the wilderness, and he fasted for 40 days and spent time with his heavenly Father. When he, he retreated, then when he reappeared, the Bible says in Luke, that's when the miracles began, and he started releasing power. After John the Baptist was killed, his cousin, the Bible says he retreated in his grief to spend time with his father, and then he reappeared, and when he reappeared, there were 5,000 people who were hungry. He released his power from that retreat by feeding 5,000 people with two fishes and five loaves. Then from that moment, he retreated back to himself and to spend time with his father, and his disciples went out on a lake, and he reappeared walking on water in the middle of a storm, displaying his ability to have power over the things that take us under. Then after a long ministry trip, he retreated onto a mountain. It's called the Mount of Transfiguration, and the disciples remained at the foot of that mountain. While they're waiting on Jesus during his retreat, a sick boy shows up, and ask for prayer. They don't have any power because they've not retreated. Jesus reappears off this retreat, releases power, and that boy is healed. After the Last Supper, Jesus retreats to the Garden of Gethsemane to be with his father. A few disciples come with him, but guess what? They didn't retreat. The Bible says they went to sleep. So when they reappear before the, the Pharisees, Jesus has power to stand and to take the cross and ultimately release resurrection power because they slept instead of retreated. They had no power, and they fell in fear. Jesus had all of God's power because God had all of Jesus' time. And the limitation of God's power in your life is how much time you're limiting God's to be with you. And th this is not about works, by the way. It's not about if I spend two hours, I get a new car. Okay, It's about a relationship. How many of you had an elementary school best friend? Come on, just stick your hand up. How many of you had a best Okay. How many of you talked to that person in the last three days? Very few of you, okay. How come? Well, because you stopped dispensing time into that relationship. You see, our relationships flourish when they get time. Relationships decline when they don't get time. So this is just about a relationship. And here's the problem, though. We don't consider that in our relationship. We're just a microwaved, express lane, fast-clicking binge watching people and we take that mindset into our relationship with God and I just need to announce to you there's no express lane in his spirit there's no zap that you can get on Sunday that does all the work there's no you know quick one push button to get all of his character that ain't the way God works despite you being in a hurry he is not and you are going to come to the place where you either give him time or you're saying I'm choosing to limit his work in my life but if you'll give him time time is where he crafts your character time is where he can break an addiction time is where he can turn you into the husband you need to be time is where he can turn you into the parent he needs to be time is how you get wisdom that you didn't have to run this business you don't know how to run you you give him time, and he can work through your life. But as so you restrict your time, so you will not receive his power. And this story is, is really stark when you consider this. This isn't about knowledge. I mean, this is not about what these women know. It's not about how much money they have. The whole thing is split on time. And it tells us a couple things. First and foremost, God's power can't be borrowed. They tried that. They said, hey, can I borrow some of your oil? And they said, that doesn't work like that. And that's because God is not going to allow me to loan my relationship with him to you. You have to have your own relationship with him. I remember one day, uh, things were crazy in our house. I mean, it, the mornings are just bananas. The kids are, are all in need and, and are hungry, and, and the, the, the games are blaring, and it's just it, it's madness. And I remember one, one morning, I look around, and Kayla's gone. I'm like, where has she went? I can't find her. She's not in the kitchen. She's not in the basement. She's not upstairs. I can't find her. I'm thinking, she has left me with five kids. What in the world? I, just about the time I'm about to call the police, I open up the garage door. She is sitting in the front seat of her car with the door closed, reading her Bible, because it's the only place she could get any peace. 
Now, now listen, I say that because if anybody should be able to siphon off God's power, it should be a pastor's wife. But Kayla is hiding in her car because she gets, I can't borrow Joe's relationship with God. I have to have my own relationship with him because I can't get his power. My relationship is mine and hers is hers. And unless we create space, we will not be able to share in it. Listen, I, I know we say things in sermons like, you know, God needs your worship and God needs your, your money and God needs your time. Let, let me just be clear. God doesn't need anything. God is contained all in and of himself. God doesn't need your money. He owns your money. You just don't know he owns your money. God doesn't need your worship. As a matter of fact, before humanity existed, the Bible says that the angels have been crying unstopped for, for eons. Holy, holy, holy. The Bible says that, that the rocks and the trees, we don't get their frequency. They're having a worship service right now while we sit in here. God doesn't need your worship. God wants you. God is so desires a relationship with you. He was willing for his son to die. God literally is dying or he died. To have time with you. Do you think he's going to let you borrow somebody else's relationship after paying that price? No. The other thing this, this story teaches us is that God's power can't be substituted. It does not read that they ran out of oil so they grabbed a flashlight. Because there's just no other solutions. They're in the dark. And that's the way, I, I know it doesn't feel that way because you're capable and you're talented, but I'm just telling you, you're in the dark without the work of the Holy Spirit. Like, there are no substitutions to that. And when we choose to wait on him, it communicates a value. Like, like, like when you wait on somebody, it, it's saying, hey, you're valuable. I have spent years waiting on Kayla. I mean, consider the distance between someone with no hair and someone with that much hair, how much time differential on preparation there is. But she's worth the wait. And when you're in a culture... And it offers celebrity and opportunity and satisfaction and strategy. And you say, no, 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 I'm going to wait on the Lord. It communicates immensely that he is the only one that has peace. He's the only one that offers joy. He's the only one that can satisfy my soul. He's worth the wait. Now, um, the other thing, and this, this one should be encouraging, is that this tells us that God's power in our lives needs to be replenished. Now, I hate to be the one that breaks this to you, but I might as well do it. Listen, you leak. You leak. Just our sin nature and our struggles and people and difficult people, they nick us and we leak out the character of God. That's the reason you're, you know, you're, you're, you're like so godly by the beginning of the day after you've had prayer, but by the end of the day, you don't look anything like God because you leak. And, and that's encouraging for this reason because, listen, some of you think, I'm, I'm just not getting this. I'm no good at this. I'm angry and I'm stressed and I'm, I'm lashing out at people. No, 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 no. You're not a bad person. You're just empty. You just need to refill God's character so you can act like him. And I, and I love it how Philippians 1.9, it says, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance, that though through prayer and the supply of the Spirit. Oh, this is encouraging. You leak, but he has an ever-flowing an ever supply. It's, it's the picture of, um, of, of a performance that runs out of funding in the Greek. But let me explain it to you this way. So in, the, in ancient Greek, they would have these big theatrical performances. There'd be a cast and a crew and a director, and they would, they would travel from town to town, and they would do these performances for entertainment. But um, this is a picture of a performance that gets to a town and then doesn't have any more funding. No more funding means no more performancing. But then all of a sudden, a wealthy benefactor comes in and pays for everything to restart. So it's a performance that comes to an emptiness, but a supply that comes in and gets it right back to where it needs to go to keep moving on. Here's what that means for your life. When you run out of patience with your kids, a wealthy benefactor in the Holy Spirit has all the patience you need for your kids. When you run out of grace for your spouse, he has all the grace you need for your spouse. When you run out of wisdom for this job and you have no more ideas to move these accounts forward, he knows all kinds of ways to move those accounts forward and he is able to take you from empty back to exactly where you need to be if you give him the time. I think this is so needed. I think this is where so many of you are living. I just sense that in prayer. Some of you, 
you're reading the Bible reading plan, you're in a life group, you're, you're, you're doing the 15 minutes of prayer, and it's not producing the results. And it's because you need to learn the art of tarrying. And so what I want to do for those of you who are willing to try it, I want to teach you how to do it. It's real simple. It's just three things. Um, I'd write these down if, if, if you want to see a new vibrancy in your faith. Here's the first one. Um, create space and, inc- and control your soul. Um, in the early 20th century, there was a devout Hindu who had a dream uh, Jesus came to him in a dream, and he converted to Christianity, left all the Hindi ways, and um, he, uh, he actually went into kind of ministry in Mumbai, and he, he um, would host tens of thousands of people who'd come to hear him preach, teach the Bible, and he would pray for people, miracles would take place. I mean, this guy saw an immense amount of God's power released. So he gained some notoriety, and they invited him to come to the United States and preach and teach and pray for people. So in 1920, he gets on a boat and leaves India to come to the United States. And it took him just over a month on this boat to get to New York. So he walks off the boat, and, the, and, and, and so the story goes, he walks out and spends 30 minutes in, in, on the streets, and then he comes back, calls his host, and cancels all of his appointments. Gets back on the boat and goes back to India. He just took a month to get here, and he he leaves after 30 minutes. Why? When asked, here's what he said. These people are much too busy to receive what God has for them. That was in 1920. Could you imagine if he visited today? And, 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 And it strikes at the heart of why this is a lost art. Every person in this room whether said or unsaid, is going, I'd love to do that, but I'm so busy. And, and, and you are. I mean, you're, you're busy with necessary things. And you're very busy with unnecessary things. I, I pulled off um, the average American, uh, some of the way they spend their time, just maybe this is you, um, first, an average American spends one hour a day grooming. And I just want to say about this one, I feel like we should be getting more bang for our buck in, in this one, I, I, you know. <laughs> I'm not seeing a one-hour kind of result for some. Um, this is my opinion in the last service. Um, spends 1.5 hours a day eating. Spends one hour per day texting. Spends two hours a day walking or playing with their pet. Spends 2.5 hours a day on social media. Ah, uh, that's low. Um, <laughs> spends five hours a day watching television or searching the Internet. Total of 13 hours. Here's my question. When do you people work? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just illustrating you have time. You have time. I have time. Do you know why I think you don't give more time? It's just theory. I think you don't give more time because you don't enjoy the time you already give. We should just be honest. I think some of us give God 10 minutes and it just doesn't do a lot for us. So why would I give him an hour? And you know why 10 minutes doesn't give a lot for us? Because that 10 minutes is the most distracted 10 minutes you could give. Like, I I mean, you're going to sit down with time with God and your body's going to be like, we need to fold laundry, we need to fold laundry, we need to return emails, we need to do, Right? And then you're going to sit down, and your mind is going to release every single crazy thought you've ever had at the same time. And your feelings are going, this doesn't work. This doesn't work. I told you this doesn't work. Do you feel anything? I don't feel anything. I don't feel anything. Let's quit doing this, right? That's, that's the way it is. And this is all. The, and then we think, this is not worth doing. Which is why, by the way, if I wanted to ruin a business, you know what I would do? Cut off its cash flow. If I'd want to ruin a relationship, I would cut off its attention. I believe if you could see Hell's staff meetings, here's what it would say. Give them their Bible reading plans. Give them their prayer lists. Give them their church attendance. Just distract them the whole time they're doing it. Because if they can't focus, they can't receive. And they'll never want more. So you know what that's going to require? Not just that you create the space, but that you control your soul. You know what that looks like? That looks like you get there and you go, body, I know you want to go do laundry and return emails, but we are going to sit here because we need the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. 
Feelings, you've never led me anywhere good, so you are not leading me in this moment either. Mind, you need to get your act together. You're going to be renewed today until we have the same mindset that was also therefore in Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to sit here because we need the Spirit, we desire the Spirit, and the Spirit can do for us what nothing else can do. Now let me give you a tip on how to do that. It's something called worship. I'm telling you, some of you are underselling worship. Like, you think we just sing because I need to get between campuses, you know, or like use the restroom between services. That's not why we sing. <laughs> this is actually, uniquely, worship takes the three parts of who you are and puts them in alignment behind your spirit. L let me explain it this way. It's just hard to scroll when your hands are raised. It it's just, it's hard to be talking to someone else when you're singing to him. It's, it, it's, it's hard to be racing in your mind when you're focused on exalting him. Worship literally emboldens our spirit. It makes us decrease and Jesus increase. And as Jesus increases, our capacity to receive for him increases. So we're going to create the space. But listen, well, you better control your soul if you want to tarry. Here, here's the second one. Uh, abandon your list and become spirit-led. Um, so most of the time when we come to prayer, and there's nothing wrong with a prayer list. Like if we're just doing our 15 minutes or our 30 minutes or whatever that is, you know, to start each day, nothing wrong with that. But in tarrying, you can't show up guarded, you're in charge, your agenda, your prayer list. Because here, here's what's going to happen. Listen, there's nothing wrong with your shopping list for God, but in tarrying, he wants to get under the surface of your heart. He wants to do a deep work in these moments. And if you just settle for showing up with your list, you're going to get through it, but you're not going to experience his power life-changing in, in you. There has, has to be a moment where you're coming not with your agenda, but, but we're letting him lead this. And, and, and the best way to explain it would be Matthew 6, 6. These are the words of Jesus. But when you pray, go into your room. Now, the word room in your Bible may say closet. That, that's a common translation. Go into your closet. Close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Okay, does this mean that Jesus is saying that I am supposed to open my closet door, go in there, move the shoes out of the way, push back the clothes, get past the Christmas decorations, and sit there and pray because there's somehow a portal to heaven in my closet? <laughs> that is not what Jesus is saying. That's Ghostbusters, not the, go not the gospel, okay? You know what the word closet like, like really get into the word, here's what it means. Bedroom. Go into your bedroom. What do you mean bedroom? The bedroom is the most intimate place in the house. It's where a husband and wife shut the door and they bear their souls to one another. He says, go into the most intimate place and open your soul to me. Did you know you can show up with, to God with your anger? He's good. He already knows. You can show up to God in an addiction. And you don't even have to say like, all right, God, I, I went like three hours and I haven't. So, I, you know, maybe I get more faith. He's good. You, you don't even have to show up to God and review all the things you did well this week. You don't even have to show up and even believe in the time you're showing up in. Like, you could show up to God and go, God, Pastor Joe said do this. I don't have a lot of faith in it, but I'm going to try. And God's good with that. And it's because we approach prayer like we do Instagram. You know, filtered, superficial, to present us as the best. I don't know if God has an Instagram account. I can tell you this from Scripture. He's not into Instagram. He's into intimacy. Which is how we show up unguarded, without pretense, and going, hey, this is the most broken, messed up part of me. Are you okay with that? And he is. I think this is the single reason, I, I really sense this in prayer for our church, this is the reason many of you remain unhealed when it comes to inner healing. So, so let me explain what I mean by that. Humans are survivors, not resolvers. Okay, you are going to experience trauma, rejection, criticism, resentment, I mean bitterness, people are going to do you wrong, injustice. And here's what happens. Because we are not resolvers and we're survivors, you just take those emotions and you shove them and push them and press them. And they just go get put back in files and files and files 
because, and then you just refocus on the present, and you call it moving forward because you think that somehow that stuff just disappears. It doesn't. And what happens is over time, it begins to subconsciously influence you. Like some of you are angry, like in this season, and there's no reason around you to be angry. You're actually angry because subconsciously it's tied back to something that happened to you years ago. Like, like some of you have anxiety, and there's really nothing to be anxious about right now around you, but, but it's because there's just some unresolved things way back there in your history, and you just kept moving forward, but they're unresolved. Okay, so, so here's what I'm, the question is not, do we need to be healed? Everybody needs to be healed. The question is, who's in charge of doing the healing? You going to heal yourself? And, and, and I only bring this up because I looked this up. I, I thought I'd help you. If you're going to heal yourself, I just need to know, you to know what you've you got to prepare to do. The human brain and its storage capacity is estimated to be 2.5 million gigs of data. Okay, I, I know that sounds crazy. So let me give you 2.5 million is what your brain can hold. Let me tell you what one gig can hold. 640 images, 230 songs, 19,200 documents. So, you, so, so one gig is, is all that, and your brain can hold 2.5 million gigs. I just don't know how you're going to get through all the memories. That's what I'm saying. Like, if you took 10 lifetimes to sift through, like, what, what, what happened here, and how did this take place? And, I mean, you got piles upon, it would take you 10 lifetimes to try to get through even just a fraction of that. And I bring that up because Romans 8, 27 says, the Holy Spirit searches the heart of man. Here's what it means. He has a unique ability to travel at lightning speed your neurological pathways, he can pinpoint that hurtful memory that's actually subconsciously supporting your addiction, anger, or anxiety, and he can heal in a moment what you would not even be able to find in 10 lifetimes if he's allowed to lead. You're never going to find that on your prayer list. You only find that when you show up and go, Holy Spirit, what do you want to talk about in this time? And he brings a memory, a hurt, a thought, and you allow him to show it to you. Now, here, here's the last one. Um, stay and receive the strength you need. Okay, so um, this, this is the most mind-blowing scripture, and, and if you'll allow me to have a personal moment with how mind-blowing this is. Jesus comes to the disciples after his resurrection, and he says, all right, you, you 12, well, 11, Judas, is, he's went off. Um, uh, guys, you've not shown a ton of promise. I'm not sure you could run a pizza place, but I'm going to entrust you to launch the church, which will be the hope of the world. So let's have a little staff meeting here. And Peter goes, you know, because it's Peter, he goes, uh, don't worry about it, Jesus. I've already, I've already talked to a marketing firm. We're working on some data analysis. I've got some ads that are going to be going out. I also went over and, and prepared this org chart, of course, me at the top. And we're getting ready to add on some new staff. We're going to build this thing. Don't you worry about it. And, and he goes, ah, oh, Peter, Peter, whom I love so much. I can't wait till the Holy Spirit comes and fixes all that in you. Sit down. Here's what we're going to do. And he says, guys, there's one thing I need you to do. One thing. Not, we're not going to hire nobody. We're not going to org chart anything. We're not, we're, we're not marketing. Listen, listen, listen. One thing I need you to do. Just one thing. If you'll just do this one thing, this is all going to be okay. And here's the thing, Luke 24, 49. Behold, I send the promise of my Father, which is the Holy Spirit, upon you, but, help me with this word, tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power on the high. He says, guys, here's the one thing. I just need you to tarry. Like stay, remain, linger in a spiritual place in my presence. And just seeking. And, and Peter, you know, he raises his hand and goes, okay, Jesus, are, are you sure you don't want to do the, like I got a lot of great plans. No, 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 Peter. Just remain seeking me. Okay, well, how long do we have to do that? Until. Just until. Until the joy comes, until the peace comes, until the victory comes. You'll know. Just stay until. What if that's the key you're missing? Like you're reading your Bible reading plan, you're praying, you're worshiping in your car, but it just still feels like you, you don't have the victory, you don't have the peace, you don't have the joy. You know what I think you're missing? You're until. 
You're doing the right thing, but you're not staying until. Listen, God never guaranteed that our strength would come in 15 minutes. That's something we superimposed on him. Sometimes it comes in 30 seconds, and sometimes it comes in three hours. What we have to do is stay until. The best way I could explain it is years ago, Kayla and I moved to uh, Birmingham, and, and I picked up really there like a love for tea. I mean, I've had every kind of tea, fruity, herbal, unsweet, sweet, all of them, hot, cold, all of it. Um, and, and my favorite restaurant in St. Louis is actually, the only reason I love the restaurant is because of the tea. So normally they would go to the back, they would bring you your tea, and it just came out of some dispenser. This restaurant brings the kit that lets you make your own tea. That's why I love it. Okay, so, so I'm assuming at 11.45, most of you know how tea works, right? <laughs> a little unsure. Let's explain it. Um, so tea is when we take hot water, and we, we're going to take hot water, and we're going to pour it in a cup. And then some of you may enjoy adding things like um, the sugar or some kind of sweetener. And then maybe for some of you, you would add cream. And then we take a tea bag, and we drop it in, and, um, and, and, and then that's how we have tea. Okay. But I, I just want to point out, I like strong tea. I don't, I don't enjoy weak tea. Here's the thing you know about tea. The water is not where the strength comes from. What you add adds no strength. Cream, no strength. Cup, doesn't bring any strength. Even the type of tea has nothing to do with the strength of the tea. The only thing that dictates the strength of the tea is how much time you give for the tea to change what's in it for what it's been put into. Listen. Oh, this is the problem. Some of y'all wondering why you don't see the power of God. You want to know why? You dip into service every once in a while. <laughs> dip into prayer when things get bad. Dip into a first. Pastor, I came to a first Wednesday three years ago. <laughs> a dip is not going to do it if you want strength. You know, this week I was working on um, a, a, my first book project, and I had this thought, um, just kind of a moment with God. I, I don't know, I've never said this, but when I was a kid in elementary school, I was in remedial reading. Like other kids got to go to, to recess, and I had to sit and work on phonics. And I just had this thought. God, how do you take somebody who couldn't read and make them into somebody who writes? I mean, I, I really do live, because here's the thing. Some of you are so capable, and God's added so much into your life, and you know how to work it all together, but you're still weak. And I'm looking at my life and I'm going, I'm not a, I don't have the capacity you do. I don't have the giftings you do. I, I, I mean, I, I don't have the, the tenacity to work. And yet I'm just looking and saying, God, how did you do all this in my life? And the Lord reminded me, when I was a teenager, I was best friends with the pastor's son. And he gave us the key to the church. And so we'd go play basketball because it had a gym. And then after we played basketball, it wasn't un uncommon for us to go into the sanctuary. And we'd turn on worship. And we'd just tarry. And then when I was in uh, college, I'd have big blocks between my classes. It was just not uncommon for me to go to my car, turn on some worship, and Terry. And then, you know, I remember my first job, I, I would leave the job, and I would pass my local church on the way home. And so I, I would often, often stop in, come in, and um, just go in and spend some time with the Lord. I just, I, it was just, I, I thought that's, I just knew I needed him. It's not about like I'm high and I just knew I needed him. And God reminded me of that. You know what he said? He said, I'm using you because you just gave me the time to work with. 
So just give me enough time. That's what you got to understand. I know you have gifts. I know you have abilities and capacity. That ain't what it's about. How much time does he have? And let, let me just warn you, you ain't going to build a godly marriage on dipping. You ain't going to raise godly kids in a godless culture just dipping. You're not going to do all that God's called you to do just dipping in every once in a while. At some point, you got to get thirsty. And you got to go, you know what I'm going to do? I don't care what's on Netflix this week. I don't care what I've got going on. I don't care what business. You know what? We're going to clear our schedules, and I'm going to spend some time, uninterrupted, un unscheduled time with God. I'm so thirsty for something more than just a devotion. I'm so thirsty for something more than just going through the motions of religious exercise. I am thirsty for the one who said, if you drink of what I provide, you will never thirst again. The wellspring of life, the source of all joy and peace. I'm so thirsty for him that I am willing to do whatever it takes to create a space for him to meet with me because because I'm just aware, I need it. I need him, so I'll tarry till he comes. I need his peace, so I'll tarry till I find it. I need his strength, so I will tarry until it comes. If you want to see God do a work in your life, you gotta stay until he comes. And there ain't no other way around it. That's how you tarry. So I want you to stand to your feet, and uh, we're getting ready to pray over our kids. But um, listen to me, listen. I'm going to challenge you. This is the challenge. Prepare yourself. I want you to find an hour this week and try to do this. Now, I know some of you are like, an hour? Oh, my gosh. I mean, three minutes, I get bored. Listen, listen. Bored ain't sin. We're, we've gotten into a place where we think, I have to be stimulated all the time. No, you don't. You know what? On the other side of bored is, you settled and resting in the presence of God where he can actually get to work on your character and your heart and those wounds that keep getting uh, untreated because you haven't given time. Board's going to be your best friend in this. I'm just thinking there's some hungry people, some thirsty people who are going to be willing to tarry. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to enter into worship. We're going to enter into worship. And here's why I say that. I don't want our kids coming in here watching you look at your watch. I want them to come in and this be so spiritually passionate and vibrant that they say, I can't wait till I get to go to church in that room. I don't want you, them wandering in here and you, you just politely waiting. Come on, let's create an atmosphere for these kids to be marked by the Holy Spirit and for them to long for him like we're longing for him. So come on, if you'd just be willing, would you just raise your hands, maybe close your eyes. Let's just begin to enjoy his presence. Father, we come to you and we thank you. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I hope you enjoyed this message you just heard. For more information and other content, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and hit that bell icon as well so you can be notified every time we upload something new on our channel. Now, while you're here, go ahead and check out past messages and other videos, and we'll see you next time.